Hi, everyone. Welcome to day, today's session. I'm Donnelly Moulton, and uh, I'm filling in for Barb Cottrell, who's having some uh, computer issues, but uh, that's okay because what better way to celebrate um, Valentine's Day than when it is with a discussion of why we hate art. And it's my um, privilege now to be able to introduce to you Robin Metcalf. Robin and I go back um, decades. Um, we met when we were 12. And when I first met Robin, Robin was a freelance writer specializing in, among other things, of course, art and the arts. And Robin left us in 2001 to go to um, Museum London as their curator of contemporary art. And we're going to hear a lot more about contemporary art um, this morning. Robin came back to Nova Scotia in 2004 as curator of St. Mary's University Art Gallery. And he's here today to talk to us about why we hate art and maybe why we should and why we shouldn't. I added that last part in there, Robin. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions and there will be a break um, throughout, um, at some point throughout the session. Um, so please grab a coffee, um, sit back and relax and let's welcome Robin and the newest art scene. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Donnelly. And <clears throat> I'd like to thank Donnelly and Barb Cottrell, uh, who have organized this lecture series on behalf of uh, SCANS, the, the um, Senior College Association of Nova Scotia. And I'd like to give a, a thanks to our, our uh, technical people here, Bob and Bill, who are making everything run smoothly this morning. Um, uh, so thank you. Merci. Well, uh, you. Uh, I'd like to note that we are, uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, Chibuktuk, also known as Halifax, in the uh, unceded and traditional territories of the Mi'kmaq people uh, in Mi'kma'ki, uh, governed by the Peace and Friendship Treaties, which do not specify any surrender of land or rights. Um, I'm pretending, however, to be in uh, my home in Sheet Harbor Passage. Uh, that's the background we have behind me right now. So I'm pulling a little, a little stunt here, uh, pretending to be in my living room. Uh, which is in Weijwik, in Eskigewik district of Nigmagi. So yeah, the title of my talk this morning is uh, Why People Hate Art. And actually, uh, we probably will just go right through. I'm planning to talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll have uh, Q&A. Um, and uh, I know my title is a little bit provocative and I know not all people hate art. Uh, it's, uh, and I'm talking specifically about contemporary visual art. Uh, when I posted this event on Facebook, I got a lot of responses from many of my friends, many of whom are artists or work in the visual arts. And some people were posting things like, well, people don't hate art, they just don't understand it, or they aren't exposed to it. Well, I agree that often the people not understanding art or not being exposed to it are uh, factors that influence uh, the subject of my talk. But I'd say if you don't think people hate art, um, uh, you haven't worked probably in a frontline public facing position like I have in museums and galleries, um, in public museums and galleries, uh, where a wide diverse audience comes comes in, because I find often that people uh, can be quite hostile or antagonistic about contemporary art, which I think is it represents a kind of defensiveness on people's part because they're they're nervous or they're, they're uncomfortable with contemporary art and they're not sure what to expect. I think sometimes people expect that a contemporary visual art is going to make them feel stupid. Um, and I want to try to, you know, uh, see what I can do to relieve people of that uh, anxiety. Um, uh, often as people, when they don't get art, they think they're supposed to get art. And uh, the first thing I want to do is give everyone permission not to get it. Um, uh, as someone who's worked as a professional art uh, critic and curator, I have to say that I have often not got art. And sometimes my most uh, rewarding experiences with art have been when I have figured out what I need to do to get <laughs> the art. So it's the journey of getting the art that uh, makes it rewarding. Um, 
uh, but when people walk into a gallery and are baffled by what they see, they uh, fear that uh, maybe there's something fraudulent going on. Maybe they're having the wool pulled over their eyes. Maybe there really isn't anything here and, and they're just being, uh, there's some kind of um, uh, scam happening or that there is something, but it's willfully obscure that you have to have a special magic key to get it. Now, it does help often to have specific knowledge if contemporary art is referring to historical art, making references to it. If you know historical art, then that makes it easier to get those references. Sometimes artists are dealing with specific uh, situations in the real world. Um, they might be dealing with um, uh, violence against women or the Holocaust. Um, and it's important to know about the Holocaust if you're going to get what that art is, is, um, is, is about, what it might be, be able to offer you. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about those other aspects of art that that are make it make it challenging for people um, and often I've heard people say things like well my three-year-old could do that um, you spent public money on that uh, or what's that supposed to mean um, I've spent a lot of time responding to those kinds of questions from people who aren't always posing those questions kindly and this lecture reflects what I've learned in the process Contemporary art is meant to be challenging, um, and it's challenging often in a different way from other media, uh, such as film, literature, or music. Now, any of those can also be challenging, uh, but um, I find that audiences in our culture don't approach them with the same kind of anxiety. Um, I can see my slides now. Uh, there, thank you. And so uh, my first slide here is from the film Twister from 1996, which uh, those of you who are old enough like me and Don Lee who met when we were 12 and were both already professional journalists, um, uh, 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 if you remember this one, it's basically it's a classic standard Hollywood um, uh, thriller with uh, a major natural force destroying everything in its path and people escaping from it and moments of terror and moments of humor. Um, and uh, my point about uh, film uh, as opposed to visual art is that people are used to a certain kind of gratification. They expect a certain kind of narrative gratification from Hollywood films. Um, um, and uh, contemporary visual art doesn't tend to offer that gratification. Now, I'm not putting down contemporary film, Hollywood film. It's usually very technically skilled in the way that it's produced, um, but uh, its character is that it gives multiple cues, the music, the pacing, uh, everything about the film gives you on multiple layers the cues of what is happening, what, how you should feel about what's happening. That in, in uh, one of the $64 words we use for that is overdetermined. Uh, so it's not, not just the image, not just the dialogue, not just the plot, it's not just the music. It's all those things together tell you what to expect. Um, so uh, next, um, wait, I can do this myself. Uh, Let's learn to use this little gadget. Uh, there we go. Um, a, a year after Twister, uh, Dante's Peak was made. And uh, basically, if you take Twister and the plot of Twister and take out the uh, tornado and put in Volcano, it's the same movie. Um, I didn't see, well, I saw Dante, I'll tell you how I saw Dante's Peak. I didn't see it in a movie theater. I never heard any of the dialogue or soundtrack. I was on a plane uh, traveling someplace far away and someone about four rows ahead of me was watching Dante's Peak on their little screen. Oh, where this went to, there, nope. Oh, we're going back and forth too quickly. Okay, that's where we want to be. Um, uh, so I was looking up from time, I wasn't glued to their screen for four rows ahead of me, I just glanced up from time to time and I saw enough to know, oh, that's Dante's peak. And oh, this is the scene where we get to, where the person that we don't really like a lot because they're kind of annoying, but here we get to learn something endearing about them so that when they die in the next scene, we feel bad, but not too bad because we don't want the main characters to die, the ones we really care about. Uh, as I recall, I think it's the woman in the front of the 
Elizabeth's boat here, who is you know, like sort of like a mother-in-law character, I think. I didn't see the movie <laughs> except for bits, but um, I remember looking up and saying, oh, here's the scene where we learn something somewhat endearing about here, and here's the scene where she dies. Um, uh, so basically, I knew exactly where I was in Dante's Peak by looking up once every five minutes and seeing a, 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 an, an image four rows ahead of me. That's what we call overdetermined. <clears throat> Now, um, Hollywood plays with that. Uh, sometimes it, you know, it, that can get kind of boring when everything in the film is predictable. Uh, this is a scene from the very first Alien, which I think is a great work of art. And one of the reasons it's a great work of art is that um, it plays with those expectations. And there's a wonderful moment in the scene where, in the movie where, We've been led to believe that that there's all kinds of horrible things that have happened, and then there's a moment where you kind of get a break and, and you get to catch your breath, and something horrible is probably going to happen in three or five minutes. But right now, it's the catch your breath scene, it's the breakfast scene, and in fact, the worst thing in the movie happens in this scene. Um, and it's particularly horrifying because you're not expecting it, because all of the cues are not telling you that something awful is about to happen. That's one of the things that makes Alien a work of art. But it just pushes things far enough to make it interesting uh, uh, without totally violating. You still get the narrative satisfaction at the end of the film, enough narrative satisfaction that people like the film. Um, recently, there's been another film that plays around, pushes things further. This is Don't Look Up, which had a really interesting uh, critical response because about half the critical response was outraged by this film. And I think they were outraged because uh, basically, um, here's a spoiler alert, uh, the planet Earth is destroyed at the end of the movie and all the main characters die. <laughs> and that's not supposed to happen. And you're supposed to have like some kind of rescue, some kind of uh, resolution uh, that, that saves us all from the terrible thing. <clears throat> and the terrible thing, which is uh, a comet hitting the earth, which is also a metaphor for climate change, uh, is not uh, averted because of human stupidity and political corruption. So that produced a lot of outrage. It pushed things a little bit too far for many people in uh, uh, away from the standard narrative satisfaction. So pop culture conditions us to expect predict predictable satisfactions um, in the way that a song or a movie narrative progresses and resolves itself. Uh, it encourages us to go on thinking and acting as we always have in the expectation that things will run more or less as they always have. And I call those technologies of persuasion because ultimately they're used in the service of encouraging us to consume more products. Painting and sculpture once were also uh, technologies of persuasion when they were used, for example, in the church uh, to uh, reinforce um, uh, religious belief and social control. But interesting art tends to unsettle our ways of thinking. Um, this is, uh, and uh, uh, contemporary art is what's left after the persuasive and the didactic content is removed. Um, there have been two revolutions in art, in the one in the past 150 years that's unsettled our established ways of seeing, and one over the past 100 years or so that's unsettled our established ways of thinking. So the first one, um, this is from before that revolution. This is the, called the Oath of the Horatii, and it's from 1784, 1785 by Jacques-Louis David. And it shows what art was like when it was more firmly ensconced in the technologies of persuasion. Um, this is uh, part of the uh, visual culture that led to the French Revolution. And we see the Horatii, who are a group of brothers who are taking an oath together. Um, so they're representative of heroic masculinity um, you can see examples of non-heroic femininity in the, the lower right there. So the, the image is very conventionally gendered. It's very clear. Visually, it's got very clear edges. Uh, you can see exactly what you're looking at. Um, it's uh, definite. It's sure of itself. It's heroic. It's inspiring. At this point, it's also faintly ridiculous because we don't believe in all the same things now that we believed in in 1784. Um, but a big change happened in visual art after the invention of photography. One, and after the political and cultural revolutions that began with the French Revolution, uh, uh, one of the, th the 
cultural and political revolutions made us less sure about some of those certainties, some of those heroic principles and uh, uh, ways of seeing the world. For example, uh, the absolute certainty about gender, uh, which was being unsettled at, at the time this painting was being made by early feminists. Um, uh, but photography had a particular effect because it gave us a techno another technology for representing what the world looks like. Uh, so uh, it, it created a bit of a crisis with painting and other forms of visual art and freed them from what their one of their primary roles had been, which was to uh, show us what things look like, what the world looks like. And so it gave artists a chance to focus more on how we look at the world as opposed to how the world looks. This is uh, by Claude Monet from 1872. So it's uh, almost a hundred years after the previous image and it's called Impression Sunrise or Impression Soleil Levant. And it actually gave its name to the uh, visual art movement called Impressionism. Uh, it was first exhibited in 1874 and the critic Louis Leroy coined the term Impressionism uh, from the title, which is Impression Sunrise. And he, that term was not meant kindly. It was uh, a hostile review. And uh, he perceived the work as being unfinished. If you think back to what people were used to images looking like, and then we go from that, which is full of people at the center of the action, uh, heroic people, important people, historic events, um, uh, you know, clear, strong narrative. Um, and then we go to this, like we don't know what's going on here. There's some boats and there's a sun and it looks like it's foggy. Um, uh, it's not a, a strongly centrally organized composition and nothing's got a clear edge to it. Uh, so for people who are used to the other kind of image, this looked like, this is not what a painting's supposed to look like. It looks like this guy barely got started on this painting. Um, but uh, the, what, we, what do we see in this painting? We see uh, the brush strokes are very evident, whereas in the previous painting, it's part of the skill of the artist that we don't see the brush strokes unless we look really closely. Um, but in this one, actually the brush strokes are, are right there for us to see. You can see them in the waves, for example. The artist is not hiding them. It's almost like he wants us to see, show them like they're the subject of the painting. Um, there's, uh, in Impressionism, there you see movement, you see you're aware of time passing, there's something um, flickering and uh, uncertain about it. Uh, but it, and it is particularly Impressionism is known for registering the changing qualities of light, in this case of a rising sun through fog and smoke. Um, so Impressionism is about human perception. This is actually probably closer to what we actually see uh, on, in this case, on a, on a foggy, smoky morning than this is. Uh, uh, and but people were used to thinking that the world looks like this and they weren't used to having images that showed them the world actually looks to us like this. So uh, Impressionism shocked people and they were outraged by it. Now it's interesting that uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, what, how many, 150 years since then, people now love Impressionism. That's because we've learned to look at the world this way. We've learned to accept representations like this as representing our experience of the world. Uh, here's another painting from that period by James McNeil Whistler uh, from 1875. It's called Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket. Um, and uh, the reception for this was very hostile. Ruskin, who was the most important British critic, art critic of his time, hated it. And he said he never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. So this is the pot of paint that was flung in the public's face. Um, now Whistler, who is also well known for his, what's known as Whistler's mother, in fact, his composition in black and gray, uh, it's kind of an irony of history that Whistler's mother is uh, known as a sentimental portrait of motherhood when in fact Whistler saw it as a basically a composition. So yeah, Ma, sit here, you'll be the, the grayish object in the chair uh, in this composition I'm doing. The title of this one, Nocturne in Black and Gold, tell, and it tells us that that's 
primarily what the artist is thinking. This is a bunch of paint on a canvas. It's a composition. Oh, and it's also an image of fireworks. So the second part of the title is The Falling Rocket. But the first part is Nocturne in Black and Gold. So he's telling us that really he mostly wants us to see this as a number of forms and colors on a canvas. And that's the beginning of a way of looking at art that uh, really came to its fore in the middle of the 20th century with abstract expressionism. And as I said, we, we've gotten used now to seeing the world represented this way. We don't find these kinds of images shocking anymore. In fact, people now get wrapping paper in the, in the, in the uh, uh, forms of impressionist paintings because they're pretty, <laughs> but they weren't seen as pretty when they first came out. Uh, now, having opened the, the, the people like Matisse and Whistler having opened the door, later artists went further. This is Matisse and it's Woman with a Hat from 1905 and from a movement that was known as Fauvism. Fauve is wild beast in French. So these painters were called the wild beasts for their kinds of really intense colors they used. And people's response to this, this, is, this goes beyond just what do we, we see immediately when we look at the world. It pulls out particular aspects of that. The, the really controversial part of this painting is the green stripe down the, the woman's nose. Uh, of course, generally speaking, women do not have green noses, um, but they actually do <laughs> in certain light. One of the things that every, uh, painters have long known is that uh, if you want to uh, show shadow and light, uh, if a face which is predominantly, in this case, her face is probably predominantly pinkish, like mine is, um, the parts that are in shadow uh, tend to go to the complementary color, which is green. And so uh, someone like Rembrandt uh, might have used a little bit of green to, not enough that your, the nose would actually look green, but would tell you this part of the nose is in shadow. Matisse took that and pushed it further and said, there's green here. I'm going to bring it right out and make her nose green. Um, so he's, it's actually still uh, working with how how we look at the world, but it's making us aware of aspects of how we see the world that we aren't normally aware of. So the second revolution came along in uh, around the time of World War I. And this is one of the most famous or infamous works of art in, uh, in contemporary art history. It's called Fountain. It's from 1917, it's by Marcel Duchamp. Um, he signed it R. Mutt. You can see his uh, signature there on, on the piece. And it is what he calls a ready-made. It is a uh, urinal, a uh, wall-mounted urinal, which has been turned on its side. Uh, he bought it at a hardware store and um, uh, put, presented it in an artist show in New York, uh, where it was actually not displayed. It was, it was in the show somewhere behind a, a, a partition or a, a, a hiding wall. The artist himself didn't know where it was. It was technically in the show, but people couldn't see it uh, because uh, the uh, organizers of the show were too shocked by it. Um, and it began a conversation about art and what makes an artwork and what is the, cent what is the central point of an artwork. Um, uh, I will note that this happened during World War I, and uh, World War I was a time of great stress and trauma, uh, similar to the time we're living in. Uh, for us, we have COVID, we have uh, climate change, we have uh, the sense of everything being teetering on an edge of uh, that the world we live in could break down. Uh, in 1917, the world they lived in was breaking down. It had broken down. They also had, uh, were approaching a major pandemic and they were in the middle of world war and the Russian revolution was uh, uh, about to happen. Um, but uh, this artwork, uh, an artist named Beatrice Wood, a New York artist who was associated with Dadaism, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, uh, she wrote about the work that uh, whether Mr. Mutt which is the name the artist used for, although it was actually Marcel Duchamp, but he signed it R. Mutt. Whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of light, life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, created a new thought for that object. And so what she said was that the art in this wasn't in the making of it uh, because the artist didn't make it. The art in this object was in his deciding to put it in a gallery as an art object and to say, here is my art. Um, Duchamp described his intent with the piece to was to shift the focus of art from physical craft to intellectual interpretation. 
And so the idea became what was most important about the art. Now, that's not true of all contemporary art, or it's true to very extensive contemporary art. But this piece and the work that followed it, uh, particularly the work of Marcel Duchamp, but of other artists who followed after it, opened up the possibility that for some art, the idea is the art. And what we might see as a physical object is simply a means of communicating the idea to us. Um, so Dadaism, uh, this is, uh, you'll see the word Dada appearing in this, which is a nonsense word uh, or a child's word uh, for a hobby horse, which uh, a group of artists, uh, one story is that a group of artists chose the word in Zurich during World War I by sticking a knife into a dictionary at random and seeing what it uh, touched, and they found that word. And the Dada artists, who again were working during World War I when everything that, the, the, nothing made sense anymore, the ways of making sense were insane. The world they were living in was irrational. And so Dadaism worked with irrationality, worked with chance. This is a, a collage piece by Hannah Hook called Cut with the Kitchen Knife Through the Late Last Epoch of Weimar Beer Belly Culture in Germany. It's from 1919, just after World War I. And so the use of found things, in this case, the collage objects, the uh, use of chance, uh, the use of irrationality and chance encounters, chance juxtapositions was central to Dada. And it opened up uh, a whole range of artistic work for the 20th century. Um, this is a piece by Kazimir Malievich, who was a, a, a Ukrainian and a later Soviet artist. Uh, who, it's called Black Square from 1915, and it's also one of the most famous artworks of the 20th century. Um, and he did a number, he also did white squares as well as black squares. Um, and uh, this one, I think all that crazing on the surface is, uh, would not have been as evident when the work was made. That's a result of age for this piece. But I've seen Malievich's in the flesh and they actually have really interesting surfaces. What you might think of in a reproduction is just a black square or a white square actually has almost a kind of, it looks like a kind of skin disease. It, 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 they're, they're, you're aware of the layers of paint within it. And Malievich is actually a highly skilled painter. I've seen representational work by Malievich, including the late work, which is a beautiful portrait of his granddaughter, uh, which I saw at the Tate Modern in, at Tate Modern in London. Um, um, and so he was quite capable of painting really well in a traditional representational way. But Malievich worked in the Russian tradition of icons. And for him, this is a highly spiritual and highly uh, works within the tradition of highly spiritual representation. And uh, it was placed in the first exhibition in a way that to Russians and Ukrainians would, would communicate this is an icon. Um, although it's clearly not an image of the Virgin Mary. Uh, but it uh, actually ha has opens up quite deep and troubling questions about spirituality. Again, it's 1915, the world is ending. And uh, this the representation, the presentation of a black square as being in some way a representation of the divine has very strong uh, connotations at that time. Now, I have heard uh, uh, some people say things like uh, Eileen Hooper Greenhill, who's a, a British expert in visitor studies, um, in her book Museums and the Shaping of Knowledge, 1992, she said that knowledge is now well understood as the commodity that museums offer. I find this a deeply troubling and, and offensive statement. First of all, the fact that museums are offering a commodity. No, museums are not offering commodities, not if they're doing their job. Um, uh, uh, they're offering uh, opportunities for growth and enlightenment and experience for citizens. It's the, not for uh, con consumers. Um, and no, knowledge is not what museums are necessarily offering. Uh, having run an art museum, I would say that knowledge is not the content of contemporary art. Art does not provide answers. Um, art is more like a question. If I, people will ask me something, like, what does this art mean? And I have to say that if I could tell you in a paragraph what the art means, I wouldn't need the art. I could put a nice paragraph on the wall and then you'd have it. Um, again, art is more like a question than an answer. And I like to say sometimes that I hope the visitor leaves the gallery knowing less than they did when they went in. That you are less certain of what you know and more open to consider how you know or think you know what you do. 
Um, I think it's an, there's an interesting comparison between art and music. If you look at the careers of Yoko Ono and John Lennon, she came in through the bathroom window, protected by a silver spoon. But now she sucks her thumb and wonders by the banks of her own lagoon. Didn't anybody tell her? Didn't anybody see? Sunday's on the phone to Monday. Tuesday's on the phone to me. Those are lyrics uh, from a song by John Lennon and Paul McCartney, and I'm assuming they're John Lennon's lyrics. Uh, they would have been unimaginable in an English language pop song 10 years earlier. Uh, they're from Abbey Road in 1969. And they're surrealistic, nonsensical. Uh, you can play with what they mean. But the Beatles were highly successful. They were the most successful band in history. And they represent the differences in how people experience contemporary songwriting and contemporary visual artists. Um, John's surrealistic lyrics are trippy, um, but Yoko Ono's art is generally, uh, and Yoko Ono herself, have generally been experienced as just weird. Um, and she's thought of as the woman who broke up the Beatles, which of course the real story is much more complicated than that. But uh, pe most people know that Yoko Ono was an artist in Japan before she met John. What people outside the visual art world may not realize is that she was actually one of the most important visual artists in the world. She's actually a really important um, uh, artist in 20th century. Uh, and this is from a piece of hers called Cut Piece from 1964. It was first performed in Kyoto. Um, uh, Yoko Ono was part of a movement called Fluxus, which led to what was uh, later known as conceptualism. And Fluxus grew out of the kind of data impulse that I described earlier. It kind of got going again in the early 60s um, with artists playing with chants um, and also uh, with, again, making the idea the center of the art piece. Saul Lewitt said in 1967 that in conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand and the execution is a perfunctory affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes the art. Now, the execution may not be perfunctory, but the artist in, in pro, what we call program art carries out a set of predetermined actions, the results of which are outside the artist's control. And in this case, cut piece, um, Yoko Ono created what she called a score, a set of written instructions to herself uh, that when they were followed result in an action, event, or performance, or some other kind of experience, uh, the results of which, over which the artist does not have full control. So the instructions for this one are the performer sits on stage with a pair of scissors in front of him, although it's actually her. It is announced that members of the audience may come on stage one at a time and cut a small piece of the performer's clothing to take with them. The performer remains motionless throughout the piece. The piece ends at the performer's option. Now I've seen the video of this piece and it is terrifying. Um, uh, the audience starts being very polite and timid and they'll cut a little tiny bit off the sleeve of, of, of what she's wearing. And then they get bolder and bolder and uh, uh, until it approaches what becomes a form of sexual violence. Uh, you can see here a man cutting a strap of, uh, of, of her clothing. Um, throughout it all, Yoko Ono sits impassively. At late in the, in, the, in the piece, she raises a hand to prevent the cloth from slipping to reveal her breasts. Um, and so this is at the end of the piece here. That piece, uh, again, if you think of the context, which is Japanese society in the uh, mid 1960s, a very polite and orderly and conventional society, which is also very uh, uh, misogynistic, where there's very strong, very strong uh, inequality between men and women in terms of what they uh, uh, they're expecting, their their frame for behavior. And so here's a woman presenting herself and giving the audience permission to act out. And the piece reveals a great deal. It reveals uh, the underlying sexual violence, I would say, of uh, Japanese society and of our own society. She has performed this work as recently as 2003. So I'm used to hearing people say things like, I could have done that. Um, 
the news stories about art uh, usually focus on something that strikes people as ridiculous or outrageous, either that or how much the art cost. This is a recent piece by Maurizio Catalan, an Italian artist. It's called Comedian, um, and you can get the pun about banana peels there. It's one of a series of three, and it was priced at $120,000. It was offered for sale at Art Basel Miami in December 19, 2019. Another artist named Datuna, a New York-based performance artist, um, uh, ate the work. They took it off the wall peeled the banana and ate it. Now, uh, the, uh, it's important to note that um, uh, the banana itself, obviously if someone buys this work for $120,000, the banana is not gonna last very long. So part of the piece is that you are allowed to replace the banana. <laughs> so the banana is not the artwork. The idea of a banana is the artwork. Um, and uh, it's a situation that's created by duct taping a banana to the wall. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna try to tell you what the artist is trying to say with that because uh, as I've said before, this is kind of, it, it, it's all kind of a joke, uh, but I don't, doesn't have to be a joke at the audience's expense. It could be a joke at the expense of contemporary art. It is setting up a puzzling situation for you to play with and think about why are people paying $120,000 for this? Um, uh, uh, it opens up an unresolved space in your mind. Uh, and that is uh, uh, what often infuriates or frustrates people, but it's what contemporary art invites you to. This is a piece, again, I could have done that. Um, Tracy Eman, British artist, called My Bed from 1998. Uh, she went through a difficult time in her life and she remained in bed once for four days without eating or drinking anything except alcohol. And uh, then this is, this is what her bed looked like at the end of that, those four days. And she looked at, back at her bed and decided to put it in a gallery. And critics claimed that anyone could exhibit an unmade bed. And Eamon replied, well, they didn't, did they? No one had ever done that before. So again, it's not that it's hard to make an unmade bed. The point is putting the bed in the gallery and what that invites the audience to engage with. It is certainly, placing, uh, it's, in a sense, it could be seen as a kind of self-portrait of her um, uh, mental health issues, her, her way she was dealing with her life, a situation that any of us could find ourselves in potentially, but it confronts you with it uh, in a way that's quite visceral and immediate. My three-year-old could have done that, uh, is something that people say all the time. It's supposed to be an insult. Uh, I will note that Picasso, who is generally regarded as a reasonably skilled artist, said that it took him four years to learn to paint like Raphael and a lifetime to learn to paint like a child. This piece is called Voice of Fire. It's from 1967. It was actually created for Expo 67. It's by the American artist, Barnett Newman. And in 1989, the National Gallery bought it for $1.8 million. And there was a huge foo for about this. Um, I will note that in 2014, this work was appraised at $40 million. So I will note the National Gallery, if you're wondering about how they're spending taxpayers' money, they got a really good deal <laughs> on this painting. Um, uh, but it raises the question of visible skill. I think that one of the reasons people feel, uh, don't know what to do with contemporary art is that if we go back to the David, uh, the traditional kind of painting, whether or not you like the painting, you can see, you can understand the skill that was involved in making the painting. That you can say, oh, well, I wouldn't be able to do that. Or it'd take a lot of training and experience for me to know how to make that image the way the artist has done it. This one, it'll say, well, I could have gone to Canadian Tire and bought, you know, two gallons of blue and a gallon of red, you know, and, and done the same, same thing. So the skill in this is not the ability to make three, three stripes, two of them blue, one of them red on, on a, on a uh, vertical surface. Um, the skill here is in uh, choosing, choosing to do so, choosing how much red and which red, how much blue and which blue, and having a sense of what those do to the viewer. Now, looking in this image, you, we're not in the gallery. We're not in front of that image, which is you know, quite tall. Um, if you put yourself in front of this, some people will just say, hmm, you know, red and blue, so, so what? Other people will sit there and be mesmerized because those colors interact with one another in a certain way. Um, and uh, if you open yourself to it, in many cases, people are capable of having quite uh, a moving experience with that red and that blue. 
But you have to be willing to stand in front of it and say, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm going to sit stand here for a few minutes to see what happens. Um, I often compare this kind of work to uh, Hamlet's soliloquy, to be or not to be, is uh, six words. Um, two of them are repeated, so it's really only four. Um, the longest word has three letters and all the other ones have two letters. It's not hard to say to be or not to be. My three-year-old could say that if I had a three-year-old. Um, and yet we generally accept that those words represent one of the pinnacles of English language literature. Because it's not that they're hard to say, it's what the context is in which they're said and when they're chosen to be said. Um, that makes them so meaningful. And we, uh, I invite you to think the same way about the red stripe and the blue stripe, the red, uh, blue stripes in this work here or in other works that when you see them, you might think my three-year-old could do this. If you have a very talented three-year-old, that may be true. Um, this is, uh, in our culture, we give a lot more space to athletics. Anyone with a body has some concept of how much effort and skill is required to achieve a certain athletic result. Uh, we don't generally feel put down upon or made to feel, oh, you're just trying to make me feel weak by running in the Olympics. No, we say that's really admirable. That person can do that. Um, uh, with traditional art, we can imagine what skill is involved in handling a brush or a chisel uh, to produce a representation of some visual aspect of the world. But with this kind of work, it, the skill is not involved prim primarily in putting the paint on the canvas. The skill is in the selection, in the choice, and in the context. But the ways that art is represented and discussed in mass media encourages false expectations. I often hear people on CBC, which is generally pretty smart when it comes to discussing film or literature, but not so smart when it comes to discussing visual art. I'll hear people saying, um, what do you want people to take away? They'll ask the artist, what do you want people to take away? Uh, there's a saying in contemporary visual art that if you want to send a message, call Western Union. Uh, for those of us who are not old enough to remember when telegrams were a thing, <laughs> that was <laughs> an earlier and more cumbersome way of sending a text message. Um, Rather than asking the artist, what do you want people to take away? I would think, like to ask the artist, what do you want them to leave behind? What assumption or way of think, habitual way of thinking or experiencing the world are you prepared to let go of? Uh, because this work of art has opened up a new space to you. It's important that uh, art is like a living creature. In a, a, re a living art is alive. And what it does is not predictable. And it should, uh, it, good art is capable of surprising and it's capable of surprising the artist, uh, not just the, the viewer. Um, politicians often talk about how culture is about telling stories. We're telling Canadian stories. Well, storytelling and narrative are basic human impulses and often telling stories is a really important part of culture. But sometimes contemporary art and sometimes literature or film are taking apart the stories that we tell ourselves or the idea that we can make sense of the world by making our experience into a story. So sometimes, no, we're not telling stories. Sometimes we're untelling stories. Sometimes we're blowing stories up. And we need to give people permission to expect that uh, in, uh, in visual art. Um, this is Jana Sterbach's work, um, uh, Vanitas, Flesh Dress for an Albino Anorectic from 1987. This is a, a Canadian artist of Czech origin. Um, and this uh, is often known as meat dress, although that's not the title of the work. The title is Vanitas, Flesh Dress for an Albino Anorectic. And it's a hand-sewn dress with 23 kilos of cured raw flank steak. Um, and of course, it caused enormous uh, um, outrage. The, it's, it, this is uh, Lady Gaga at the 2020 MTV Video Music Awards, accepting the award for best for, for bad romance um, in a dress designed by Frank Ferdinand's, uh, Fernandez, which is also made out of meat. And uh, so clearly, uh, you know, this is a later iteration of the same idea as Yana Sterbach's Vanitas. Time magazine named this the top fashion statement of 2010. I'll note that British performance artist Linda Sterling wore a meat dress in 1982 to protest men's perceptions of women. It's interesting how art will become the focus, especially when art uh, wastes something like uh, uses 
food that could be eaten but now can't be eaten because it's been made into uh, an, an artwork. There's always predictably uh, a wave of public outrage about how artists have wasted food when people are going hungry. I will note that the United States wastes 219 pounds of food per person annually. That's 40 million tons. It's 30 to 40 percent of the U.S. food supply. The Guardian noted in 2014 that the world wastes the equivalent of 12 billion animals a year. My point is not whether using raw meat to make art is ethically justified. It's just to note to ask you to compare how much outrage there is against the use of 23 kilograms to make one artwork of meat versus the outrage that's generated by the annual slaughter of 12 billion animals whose flesh is put to no use. Art serves very handily as a scapegoat for the uh, injustices of our society and for the wealthy class. People associate art with wealth uh, because uh, mostly what we hear about art is about art that costs fabulous amounts of money. What isn't communicated there is that only a tiny fraction of art sells for high prices. It's almost never the artists who are getting rich. Uh, it's a really good career move if you're a visual artist to be dead. Um, uh, die first and after that your art go way up. Um, for every wealthy artist, there are thousands of artists living near or below the poverty line. Museums make the mistake of trying to make art easy. I, again, I compare this to athletics. Um, if you go to a rock climbing wall, rock climbing place, you don't expect them to provide a ladder for you to get to the top. That would uh, you know, uh, be against the point of the whole exercise. We accept physical challenge more readily than we accept intellectual challenge. And that's because I think our education system hasn't prepared us. Uh, too often, I remember this from being a student in school and seeing that school system was there to make people feel stupid. Um, to tell them, to train them that they were stupid. Um, I was lucky. I was raised by parents who gave me tools to resist that and to continue feeling smart. But it wasn't because I was inherently more intelligent. It was because I uh, wasn't trained to think of myself as stupid. Um, uh, and so we uh, respond defensively uh, uh, to artwork. And too often museums try to deal with that in the name of access and engagement, which are both really important things, access to museums and engagement of the public are, are things that have, have always been key issues for me in my own work, but they're not the same as gratification. It doesn't mean offering people a predictable satisfaction when they get to museum. We need to signal to visitors that it's okay not to get it. It's okay to leave the museum feeling perplexed. The satisfactions of art are not to be found in ready answers. We can help artists, we can help visitors, uh, in their experience of art without condescending to them. This work here um, is by Gerard Choi and it's called One Ton of Wonton Bowls. It's an installation of 279 solid blue cement bowls. Um, and this is at St. Mary's University Art Gallery in 2008. And together they weigh one ton, which is where the, ton, the, the title comes from. It's one ton of wonton bowls. Each of them is the size of a normal wonton bowl. Um, while I, this show was up, a student who was working as a security guard came into the gallery and was quite incensed about the work and basically asked me, well, what does that mean? And so I told him uh, a bit about the artist who was born in Singapore and moved to Canada as of Chinese ancestry, about the history of Chinese porcelain, which was a major industrial um, uh, export by China for many centuries, and was it used the color of blue that is visible in these works and how it relates to the experience of the Chinese diaspora uh, uh, that the artist experienced. And uh, just by giving him a few, uh, a few clues, a few tools for approaching the work, um, he went in five minutes from what does that mean to wow, that's so cool. I'm so glad that he voiced to me his outrage about the work. Many people would just turn around and walk out and not say anything, but it gave an opening, gave me a chance to help him find a way into the work. This is my last slide. And this is an Acadian uh, artist uh, works with ceramics named Leopold El Foulem. He's from Caraquet in uh, the Acadian Peninsula in New Brunswick. And he's world famous in ceramics circles. And you can see some of his work and the work of, of Richard Millet and Paul Mathieu, who are colleagues of his in the back. It's a show called Campfires, which was at the Gardner Museum for Ceramics in Toronto in 2014. 
And um, uh, none of Leopold's work is functional. He will make uh, something that looks like a vase, uh, but at the top where the opening would be, he will put a shiny black disc, which is a representation of the opening. There is no opening. It's a, a representation of the opening. And he will say <clears throat> that what he has made <clears throat> is a representation of a vase. And for him, it is the idea of the art that, uh, and this art is very, very dense, full of references to the various histories of ceramics in different cultures. <clears throat> when he spoke in Halifax during an earlier exhibition, one of the students at NASCAD who came from the ceramics department was quite outraged that he made work that was not functional. And she asked him, why do you make work that is not functional? And he said, but it has a function, it makes you think. On that thought, I will uh, uh, end my talk. I will just make a uh, note that there is an exhibition of which I'm the guest curator that's opening uh, at the uh, end of this week at St. Mary's University Art Gallery. They're not having a formal opening, but the gallery will be open to the public uh, and uh, to visit it. It's called Phase Variations, and it's by the artist Lou Shepard, who does uh, sound and movement-based installations based on uh, data sets. For example, Lou did a work where um, he uh, composed scores for an orchestra based upon the data of melting glaciers. In this case, with phase variations, uh, Lou has visited my home, which you can see behind me here, where I have a large uh, archive of uh, queer of 2SLGBTQIA plus uh, documents and uh, materials that I've been collecting since the mid 1970s. And I'm developing that space uh, under the title of the Passage Memory Project as a place for um, conversations and interactions around queer history, archives, culture, literature, visual art, and uh, sitting and having conversations over supper or working in the garden. And uh, this is one of the, uh, Lou is one of the researchers who's used that space to generate, uh, in this case, visual art, which will be uh, up at the, is up at St. Mary's University Art Gallery. Um, so I will hand it back at this point with thanks to Donnelly. Thanks, Robin. That was fabulous. I think at this time, the intent is that we will take a break and then we will come back and we will um, open it up to questions um, for Robin. And that's very fitting because as Robin says, the whole discussion about art is to leave with questions. So I'm hoping that we can over the next uh, 10 minutes while we get a cup of coffee is that we can uh, think about what we've heard and come up with some questions. Then we're gonna come back Robin and, uh, and hear some more. All right. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back. And uh, we have some questions here for Robin. I'll start with the first one that you can see. Uh, Robin, um, one of our folks says, I couldn't find out much about St. Mary's Art Gallery online. Can you repeat the hours, et cetera, for the opening, as you mentioned? Okay, I don't actually know what the hours are. I'm, I'm, of course, I was the director curator of St. Mary's, but uh, now I'm not there now. Um, but uh, if you go to the St. Mary's University website, smu.ca, uh, under Campus Life, you'll find uh, Art Gallery. And under Art Gallery, go down to Exhibitions, because the first page you see doesn't have a lot of information, but I'm going by memory here. But if you open up Exhibitions, it will bring to a more th full um, uh, website. But I can also give you that website, which is SMU Art Gallery at squarespace.com. Com. That's SMU, SMU, SMU Art Gallery, all one word, at squarespace.com. And <clears throat> there you'll, you should see more complete information. Um, I haven't checked the, the website recently, but uh, you, uh, that would be where you could find that. And you can also check the Facebook page for the gallery. I know that there's a, and um, the gallery is supposed to be open this Friday coming, the 18th pardon me, 18th from four to seven for a, a soft opening. It's, it's, not a, it's not a formal opening and there won't be any food or anything like that, but the gallery doors will be open and the artist will be there and I will be there as well if you're able to come on Friday between four and seven in Halifax. Okay, uh, Donna, by the way, has added the URL for that to uh, the chat so people can pick it up on the chat as well. Uh, Brent asks, can you offer your thoughts on the artist Banksy? His work, as I simplistically understand it, has an element of public performance. It also seems to be driven by the artist's intent to make art accessible and even unpredictable. 
Do we separate the persona of a given artist from his or her works, or is it inherent to our understanding of the piece? Well, that's a, that's a couple of questions. Um, uh, Banksy's work uh, is very political. Uh, it's, he's generally executed most of his work as um, public graffiti, so uh, paintings on walls in public spaces. Uh, and he doesn't present himself. So uh, people actually haven't seen Banksy or haven't, he hasn't presented himself to people, say, in public as Banksy. So we don't actually know what he looks like. Um, uh, but uh, his work appears, uh, well, particularly in England, where he's based uh, in, shows up in public spaces. Um, and he has a very particular visual style, which now other graffiti artists are copying. But for example, he's also done work on the dividing wall between Israel and Palestine. Um, so it's quite politically engaged. And his act of uh, presenting his work in that way is part of his po politics, uh, that it's not in, it's, it's not uh, it's, it's in public spaces, it's accessible to anyone. Um, it's not something you have to pay for. Uh, although he does sell work, although he famously produced a work which was a girl with a balloon, uh, which was framed, was sold at um, Sotheby's. And I can't remember what it sold for, it sold for some fabulous amount of money. And then as soon as the gavel went down, a little machine went on inside the frame, which shredded the <laughs> half of the work. Now the work has since been resold for a much higher amount. So the half shredded painting <laughs> drawing is worth more than the original unshredded drawing, which is a good example of how it is, it really is uh, evidence of something that happened. And the thing that happened when the work was uh, um, uh, shredded is, uh, is really part of the artwork. Uh, you, in terms of the persona of the artist, I think with someone like Banksy, <clears throat> his persona is a fact in the world, like he, when he's presenting his work in the world, he can't ignore the fact that he is a, a famous artist named Banksy and that people understand his art in a certain way. That is uh, part of the condition and the context of the work that he has to consciously work with. Great, thank you. Carol, uh, oh, sorry, uh, just the question here. Carol was uh, musing about, I suppose, what made an impressionist movement possible was the ability to do on-site paintings, thanks to the invention of paint in the tubes. Do technical advances like this contribute to the change in what painters do? Uh, well, thank you. And hi, Carol. Um, uh, this is a question that's an informed question by a painter. <laughs> and uh, yes, I mean, there's two things here. One is the on-site uh, or en plein air, as uh, would have been said in fresh air. Uh, and impress certainly the Impressionists worked en plein air. And they were able to do that because of uh, this technological advance in the Industrial Revolution of paint being available in tubes. It's a very uh, it's an uh, insightful point that Carol makes because, of course, uh, art is constantly changing in response to technical capabilities. The invention of video, of handheld video cameras in the 1960s, which at that time were enormous by our standards, but there, you could still carry them on a shoulder. It created video art, which is a very different art form from film. Um, and uh, it came into being, it became possible because of the invention of the state of technology at that time. So yes, the, uh, you, you know, in, you can look at something like Impressionism and read into it, uh, not just changes in concepts of the world, but also changes in, in technology and our material relationship with the world. Thank you. Um, Robin, I'm going to skip to one that came in in our chat line. Um, from Pat. Thank you, Robin and Scans. A very engaging presentation. I'm tuning in from Vancouver where I plan to see the Yoko Ono exhibit at the Vancouver Art Gallery <clears throat> soon. I was happy to see Don't Look Up included. Unsettling uh, is the only theme I can, I can grasp for the daily art of, be, of being at this point in life uh, on this planet. I'm interested in your thoughts on the role of contemporary indigenous art in that quote, to be or not to be scenario of the moment, uh, unsettling life and art. Well, and hello, Pat, who is also a friend of mine and uh, someone who has uh, I've been a friend of my brother for many years. Um, uh, I'm glad you're gonna have a chance to see Yoko Ono at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, 
in terms of contemporary indigenous art, well, that's a very good point. It's, uh, if I had more time, I would have gotten onto in my talk. Of course, when I say to be or not to be, I'm talking about the our understanding of European settler culture. Uh, and uh, contemporary Indigenous artists are working in uh, some of the most interesting contemporary art in Canada is coming from Indigenous artists. And often they're working in ways that that draw on both the uh, traditions of European art, which of course they've been immersed in uh, under uh, terms of colonialism, and the, the traditions of Indigenous art, which have in many ways been in, interrupted and suppressed by colonial powers. And so the act of reclaiming them is uh, a, a form of resistance. Um, but if we look at artists like Kent Monkman, uh, his uh, visual vocabulary is that of Western uh, European art, uh, which he is a master at. Um, he could have been a great 19th century salon painter, but his content of that work uh, draws on uh, indigenous and queer indigenous experience. Uh, and so it, uh, the very use of European traditions helps to problematize them, to make them more complex, to uh, using them to deliver an anti-colonial, uh, uh, decolonial message. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's more I can say to that. I mean, yes, unsettling is what the world is right now. And, and maybe people don't feel like they need art to make it more <laughs> themselves more unsettled than they already are. But I think that the unsettling that art provides is hopefully a, a kind of unsettling that helps us to deal with the what's unsettling in the world overall by unsettling some of our received opinions and our received behaviors and create a space in which we can be more open to behaving and acting differently, including uh, uh, under, you know, under behaving and acting differently in terms of settler colonialism and racism. Charlene asked, I would like to hear your thoughts about the contemporary photography and if it is suffering from expectations to tell the story or create pretty pictures is social media broadening audience expectations and appreciation well um uh i'm just going to ask bill if you can move that because i'd like to see the question while i'm uh, yeah thank you um uh uh Photography has been a battleground since it was invented, and um, the question of uh, how contemporary photography or whether photography would be accepted as an art form, uh, that one, I would say that was answered uh, for some people right away. <laughs> In the 19th century, some artists used photography and used its specific capabilities uh, uh, from the beginning, uh, but by the early 20th century, uh, photography, uh, photo photo photographers had clearly claimed a space for photography within modernist art. Art. Um, the expectation to tell stories, create pretty pictures, well, that's, that's a cultural expectation that still pertains, I'd say, generally, um, and still complicates people's uh, um, understanding of contemporary art in any medium. Um, I think it's a big question here about how social media and the universality of photography, the fact we now live in a culture where billions of photographs are being created all the time by people with their cell phones and by CTV cameras everywhere. Um, uh, we're saturated in images now. And what does that mean for photography? Uh, it certainly creates a different context for photographers who are using photography whether it is to make us see things we might not have seen otherwise or to see differently. Uh, I would say photography uh, can continue to work with those, but it also, what's, what's happened is photography in many ways, I think now has, is, is in the same condition as painting because you can create uh, any image in photography, you can create an image that looks like it was taken from real life in the world, but it was actually created on a computer. Uh, so CGI and various forms of Photoshop, et cetera, uh, have meant that, that essentially when you're working in, uh, in photography on a computer, what you're doing is not that different from what painters do. You're creating an image, uh, it, making, you're choosing the image that you're making uh, in a way that uh, the machine of the, the, the camera itself is no longer uh, uh, as, directly, uh, as directly dictating what that image is. Carol again asks, uh, I gather Jerry Ferguson got a student to do paintings for him. The idea, not the production of the work, was what was important. 
Do you think that's legitimate? Um, yes, uh, and it goes back to the fact that uh, when we look at Duchamp, he did not make the urinal, he signed it and he put it in uh, an exhibition. Uh, but uh, in uh, the case of Jerry Ferguson, the, the, there is a criticism of Jerry Ferguson. Um, he got Jerry Collins, a younger artist who was a painter at NASCAD to paint the paintings. And um, Jerry is also uh, from St. John New Brunswick, a very talented uh, painter. Um, uh, the, 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 there are questions uh, about the relationship between the teacher and the student and the, uh, the whether or not Jerry Collins' work as a painter was in some way effaced or you know, subdued below that, the, the reputation of Jerry Ferguson in those works. I mean, Jerry Collins was not as well known when he did that work as a student than he later became. Uh, that would be to me um, uh, a question around that work question they both have but the, but but it's he's not Jerry Ferguson was not hiding the fact that Jerry Collins was painting those paintings he was again uh the paintings also uh, as I recall were based on uh postcards so they were like scenic postcards of Atlanta Canada if I recall and then being done by a painter who could also do landscape painting um so again it was uh, Jerry Ferguson was setting up a situation where we ask ourselves how many filters are there uh, between us and the landscape that shape our expectation of it. There is the postcard image. There is the painter who decides that this postcard image is going to be rendered. And then there he's handing it over to another painter who's then doing the painting. And uh, so it, uh, going back to the, the fact that often there are ideas that play in art that are as important as the actual um, uh, physical act of putting paint on a canvas. Robin, uh, we have uh, one of our members uh, or listeners is going to come in uh, orally now. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, Victoria Parker. You had raised your hand. Uh, you can speak with Robin. Victoria, if you're there, you'll have to unmute your mic. Okay. Okay, go ahead. There. Uh, sorry, that was an accident. I was just uh, checking out some of the keys and the options I had, but thank you. This has been a wonderful lecture. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria. We'll move on now. Uh, Alan asks, uh, any thoughts about Jeff Koons? He doesn't actually make any art himself. He just hires people to do it for him. Um, this is uh, much the same question as yeah. the one that was asked about Jerry Ferguson. Uh, and again, I go back to Duchamp, uh, that uh, the, the actual act of having a work fabricated, uh, you know, another artist I've worked with a lot is Michael Lexier, and often he has his work fabricated by industrial methods, um, is uh, where when, when the idea of the art or the design of the art in, in, uh, is what makes it interesting, is what the artist is presenting to us. Uh, it, it's not necessarily the making of it. We're used to thinking of art that the skill is in the making and for much art, it is. And uh, in certain cases, that's appropriate to look at it. How did this artist, how did this painter put this paint on this canvas? What skill does it show? The embodiment of the artist is, is, uh, is important in that, or a sculptor who is um, uh, cutting stone or, or um, uh, molding in clay. But uh, again, it's what is the content of the art? Is the content of the art the making of it? Or is the content of the art the idea of this image or this object and where it's being placed and how, you know, what context is it being placed in? And if that's the content of the art, uh, then uh, it's, it's completely legitimate to, if you have it made industrially or have someone else make it uh, for you, uh, because the physical skill of making is not necessarily central to the, what the artist is asking us to experience or to consider. Okay, Robin, thanks. Uh, Anne asks, uh, could you to speak a bit more about the change in viewing of art when photography began? 
Well, one of the interesting things, and hi, Anne, as well. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about photography is that when it first began, when people wanted to make photography artistic, they tried to make it like painting, so that uh, photographers would spread the emulsion on, on, on a paper, for example, in a way that re reproduced brush, brush strokes. Um, uh, th that was because photography struggled for a while to become an art form to determine what, what is it that makes uh, a photograph an art form. Um, and I, what photographers mainly went towards is what uh, the uh, uh, photographer, um, uh, I believe it was Brassard, I said that uh, French photographer said that was the decisive moment, which was um, you lift the camera, you press the shutter. It's when you press the shutter. There's a famous picture with a, a man jumping over a puddle and he's in midair over the puddle. It's from the early 20th century. And uh, so it's where do you point it? How do you frame? Where does the picture begin and end? At what instant do you press the shutter? This is in photography as it was would have been uh, technically what was technically possible, let's say the 1890s or the early 1900s. Um, those became the actions that the artist had control over was timing and framing. Uh, and then to some extent exposure and the uh, way in which it was developed. So those were the areas where the art came into photography. It reminds me again of the question of uh, when the, if an artist does not fabricate the art with their own hands, it's what are the elements the artist has control over? They're the things that we can judge the art by. Um, that is what the content of the art is. The uh, Taya asks, uh, given that the reception and appreciation of art is so subjective, is there such a thing as bad art? And if so, who makes that decision? Well, I'd say, and hi, Taya, um, uh, the, uh, as with anything else in life, uh, there is no absolute authority. I often find myself as a critic and a curator put in the position of being an authority on art. And I have uh, an informed opinion <laughs> on art and being informed is valuable. Um, and uh, people with informed opinions, their opinions should be given weight based on how well informed they are and how what their history of judgment is if you if their history shows that they have interesting or good judgment but there is no final word on that um uh you are free to decide i will say it's not i don't say that everyone's opinion is worth the same amount if it's an unconsidered opinion if it's an opinion that's not deeply informed that opinion is not as an interesting an opinion as someone who's given it more thought and who is more informed on the subject. But, but nothing says that one person's opinion is absolutely correct and another person isn't. Um, it is uh, an exercise. It is part of the process of art is to engage with it, to come to your own judgment. Uh, and I encourage you to come to that judgment uh, by informing yourself, by giving it consideration, by giving it time, and by having conversations with other people, then your opinion may, may change. Um, but that is a process. It's not a, a final destination. Francis uh, asks, uh, my question has to do with the difference between the work of the three-year-old and the legitimate artists. What is the difference in your mind, other than perhaps technique? Does it lie with intention? Well, I think it has to do with uh, consciousness and consciousness, um, uh, how conscious you are of what you're doing, how much um, self-reflection there is in what you're doing, which can get in the way of uh, the art. Um, and I think when Picasso talked about learning to paint like a child, he was talking about having to unlearn things he'd learned. Now, it, it helped that Picasso was able to paint in the great 19th century salon style. He could do those paintings, although we, don't, we only see them from very early in his career, that kind of traditional painting from him. But he had those skills. And having those skills in reserve gives you more capability of what you can do. So that's the difference between the, the, the trained artist and the child. But what the child has is an openness and uh, a lack of certain preconceptions, and which is the freshness of vision that uh, someone like Picasso aspired to get back to, to be able to reclaim that. Uh, if you can have that level of skill and experience and combine it with, uh, with the freshness of vision that a child has, then that's, I think, the, the state that uh, Picasso would have aspired to. Andrew asks, uh, is there not a contradiction between your insistence that museums are not commercial enterprises 
And you are touting of the fact that the voice of fire has increased so much in value since it was produced uh, or purchased rather by the National Gallery, hence a brilliant investment. Well, uh, I, uh, I would not surprise to have Andrew Terrace uh, proposing a, uh, a bit of a challenging question here. Uh, when I say uh, museums ought not to be commercial enterprises, all too often I'm afraid they, uh, they are under pressure to operate as if they were. Um, I actually generally don't like to talk about the investment, the, the uh, appraised value of artworks. It's the wrong question. People often say, well, how much is that worth? And the, I will note that for a, a public gallery with a public mandate to collect art, uh, the collection is not an asset financially. It's cultural asset, but financially it is a liability because uh, the more the work is worth, in market value, the more you have to pay to insure it <laughs> and to protect it from theft. Uh, you cannot, it's not liquid asset. You cannot sell the artwork and use it to pay for the cost of running the building. That's unethical. Uh, you can, in some cases, sell an artwork if you, in your collection. Uh, if it doesn't suit the mandate of your collection, and if you're selling it to another collection, uh, um, for example, if you're transferring it to a different museum where it may be better cited, and then you use the funds to buy other work for your collection. Um, uh, but uh, the, uh, it's a common misconception that collections are liquid assets. They are not liquid assets. Um, uh, they are something you are responsible to take care of in public trust. <clears throat> but the, the point of the, the, the good deal is that if the gallery wants to have an important representative work of, of American mid-century abstract art, uh, it's better that they get it for 1.8 million than $40 million because they can use the other $38.2 <laughs> million to buy other work like contemporary indigenous work by Canadian artists, for example. Uh, so that is my point about why it was actually smart of the National Gallery to buy the work at the price they bought it at. Uh, Robin, we're going to take uh, two more questions and we'll be shutting down the question pipe at around 11.30, so in a couple mm -hmm. of minutes. Um, I'll skip down here to Laura asks, how would you describe the Nova Scotia art scene today? Oh, uh, that's a complex question. I don't know if I can do that justice in a, in a minute or two. Um, the uh, like art scenes everywhere, it's in flux. I'd say the most interesting thing that's happening is the emergence of new voices. Uh, the artists coming from the African Nova Scotian community, from the indigenous community, um, from the 2SLGBTQIA community, artists of disability. Um, and I think we're still uh, opening up the space for those. And, and, and um, uh, it's a challenge for museums and institutions to uh, relearn new ways of doing things. Uh, and not just for those artists, but for those publics as well. Uh, that's probably the most interesting thing that's going on in the art scene today. Um, Nova Scotia art scene is challenged because the uh, level of public funding is very low. Um, we do have the Nova Scotia Arts Council, but it's funded at a very low level. Uh, we do have some funding from the city in Halifax. The places in Canada where the art scene is healthiest get strong funding from all three levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal. Um, we get good funding from Canada Council, but even that is limited. Limited because if artists aren't supported on the other levels, it's hard for them to get to the point where they can then secure good funding from Canada Council. So uh, this is a, a pitch for the municipalities and the province to up their game uh, and can and increase the amount of money that goes out through arm's length funding. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, I'd say that th those are the main points I see in the art scene right now. Okay, Robin, thank you very much. Uh, we've come to the end of our, our time allotted for question and answer, and I, there are still a couple of outstanding questions. And for, sorry for we couldn't get them, get them on the air, but uh, Robin will be able to see them and uh, may be able to respond at that time. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Donna Lee to come back in and say our adieu. So here's Donna Lee. Oh, thank you, Robin. That was incredible. It was both informative and challenging. It was an absolutely fabulous way to start a week. Um, I appreciate um, learning a little bit more about art, but I also appreciate the fact that I don't have to any longer bear the burden of knowing <laughs> the art. And I think that that was a, a, a critical um, revelation that it is about what can we let go of as opposed to 
what can we logically ascribe to this, this piece of work? And, and may I say, Robin, that, that to the best of my knowledge, you are our first presenter ever to have burst into song. So, so, so we appreciate that. From a, a SCANS perspective, um, I'd like to thank Bill and Bob, who are always with us from a technical perspective, always pressing buttons and smiling and trying to nudge us and guide us into directions so that everything works as wonderfully as it does. Um, I'd also like to, to thank Barry Patrell who, who organized this event and put everything together, um, went out and bought an, um, an Apple iPhone and no longer has email, <laughs> but that is a technical <laughs> issue we will, we will leave with her to resolve. Um, once again, I'd like to thank all of you for, for coming and attending. There will be a, another lecture in March um, on a health-related issue, and we may have a special third um, uh, presentation as well um, during this period, um, if we're able to line everything up. But for now, we get to uh, exit thinking about art and how we can approach art in ways that perhaps we never have before. And thank you for that, Robin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.